Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to the study this morning. And uh, but you can see on the other camera there that we finally have no smoke in the air. Uh, you can see the blue sky. It's kind of nice. We had a little bit of rain. And uh, so that's refreshing. But all of us should be thankful for this morning, for what God is doing. And, and uh, let's begin our study with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for the time that we have each morning, that we can open your word together and that we can listen to you speak to us. We ask, Lord, that you can be in our midst, that you can guide and lead in this study, that you can give us a clear mind and an understanding heart, that you can help in our communication with one another. Um, and we pray that uh, you can... Uh, work upon the heart of each individual. We know, Lord, that we are in a trying time in this world, that Satan is seeking uh, to destroy this work, and so we pray for each other. We pray for those in the American and Canadian groups and those around the world who are searching for truth. And um, we know, Lord, that we have much to learn. Be with us now through thy spirit. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again. Now, um, in these studies that we've we've spent a lot of time on judges, and we're, we're now going back over the story of Gideon, and we're going to look at Gideon in the context of these lines that we had created. So... In these charts here, looking at, we can see that we have these two lines, Jeroboam and Gideon. And what we don't have on these lines, we do have the way marks, which we marked out when we went through it last time. Um, but what we don't have is the Bible verses that that apply to these lines. And we don't on these lines if someone was looking at it without any information. Uh, they might recognize some of the dates because these are pretty common dates in our movement. Um, but they wouldn't know why we're, we're creating this line and why we're, why we're calling it the line of Jeroboam. So we can see that this line, the line of Jeroboam and the line of Gideon, both have uh, the way marks of November 9th, July 18th, and December 25th, 2021. Otherwise, the other way marks differ. They're, they both have December 25th, 2020, though there are different way marks in each of these lines. And in each of them, we placed a fourth angel arriving and another fourth angel arriving. So we need to explain that. We need to have that uh, clear. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each of these lines and give them their own uh, PowerPoint page so we can put... Uh, more information on them. And so you're going to have to help me here as far as how we're going to, uh, what we're going to add to them. Let's take it this way. So the line of Jeroboam, we know that this is the line of Gideon. It's a, it's a line that, uh, oops, for some reason I didn't copy this properly. I just selected it. Okay. Um, so when we did these lines here, um, we had Jerbail and, and Gideon. And uh, so now we're just going to look at Jerbail. Now, what is the line of Jeroboam about, and why did we call it Jeroboam? So it's Gideon's new name. Okay, so he gets this, this new name, and why does he get this name? Because he's torn down the altars of the city. Okay. 
So he's torn down the altars of the city, and 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 these are altars to Baal, right? What does Jeroboam mean? Let Baal plead. Okay. So now it's it's um. So what is the significance of that name? Why is it? Why is it there? Like why is why is he called that? Let Baal plead. Is it sort of a, a an ironic name? Like a, a bit of a mocking towards uh, Baal. I think it's a mocking both toward Baal, but also toward the men of the city. Okay. So so who who called him Jeroboam? His father did. Okay. Right. So his father's going to name him this. Now, his, his father, is his father upset that he tore down the altar? I would have to say that he's not. Okay, you're saying he's not upset. Okay. But um, possibly scripture is saying something different. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I, I think it's not as uh, clear as I would like. How do we spell Jeroboam? Oh, it has two Bs. Um, right, so in, in reading it, uh, in Judges 632. Um, and Joash said unto all that stood against him, will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death, whilst yet it is morning. If he be of God, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar. Therefore on that day he called him Jeroboam, saying, let Baal plead against him, because he hath thrown down his altar. So, um, so Joash, of course, is the father of Gideon, right? The men of the city, they're upset, right? Because Correct. the altar's torn down. But the father of, of, of Gideon, he's making this speech, if you want to call it that. It's very short. But he's saying, you know, can't Baal plead for himself? Right. So he's going to name Gideon this name, uh, let Baal plead. Okay, but in, in this situation, I would have to agree with Angela with the comment she posted in the chat, because this is not unlike what Elijah had to say before all of Israel. Right. So so we can, we can look at, at this as a parallel to uh, the story of Elijah, right? This mocking of Baal. So, so that's the way we look at this name. Let Baal plead. It's it's meant as satire, right? Because they're not because Baal can't actually plead, right? You're you're being kind to say it's satire. I'm I'm saying it's more sarcasm. Okay, sarcasm. But still related. Yeah. So, how in in the way that Joe Ash presents this? Yeah. Okay, as it says in Scripture, and Joash said unto all that stood against him, so all that stood against Gideon, yeah. will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him put to death whilst it is yet morning. If he, if Baal be a god, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar. Right. So Baal should be able to to um, defend himself. Correct. And and yeah, so that's that's why he's given this name. Now, so so we have this line of Jeroboam, right? And in this line, like all lines, we have a period of darkness. And we're putting that this period of darkness is prior to November 9th, 2019. That is, when we looked at the previous waymark, the previous waymark being uh, Deborah and Barak, 
against Cicero, we come to the fact that, that there is this message that precedes November 9th in this movement, and that message has darkness attached to it. And when we looked at this before then, um, and we're trying to look at how this line of Jeroboam, how it um, is a line, what are the messages that are here, we can see that this message is going to be regarding the proclamation or the warning to Nashville, right? That's what it's going to be about. And, and Nashville is the attack that we're looking at, is uh, the Parthenon, right? That's what we're, we're looking at. So there is this idol in this temple that was placed there um, during uh, the World's Fair, right, in, I can't think of the year, 1890, was it 1890? Um... That wasn't the, uh, the World's Fair, it was uh, centenary, Tennessee, it was a state. It's and a state fair. In... Yes. I, I understood it's yeah, a World's that... Fair. It, it's... No, I, I think it was just like a, the centenary for the state of North Tennessee. Yeah, it, well, that's wasn't true. a World Fair. Well, it's true, but it still was a so, World's Fair. That's what I understood. It's maybe like a, it was maybe like a World's Fair. Um, no, it was in 1897. Right. So it's going to be, um, yeah, they call it the Tennessee Centennial and International Exposition. Right, which celebrated the 100th anniversary of Tennessee's statehood. Right. And and this would be the World's Fair. No. So, a different, different situation. Okay. Um, okay, you have to explain to me how this isn't the World's Fair. Okay. World's fairs are normally only for a six month period. World's fairs are also very specific about what their purpose is. Okay. Now, this is, while it is specific, it's about Tennessee statehood. It's celebrating the 100th year of that statehood. So that's, a bit different. It's it's not the same as the Columbian Exposition that took place in Chicago in 1893. It's not the same as the Ecological World's Fair that took place in Spokane in 1974. This okay. was something recognizing a 100th year anniversary. Okay. Okay. So... So I made an assumption because they have a World's Fair every four years, and the one in Chicago was a World's Fair. That is correct. Uh, but the World's Fair in 1897 wasn't in Nashville. That was in Brussels. Right. Okay. Okay. So I was wrong there. Uh, and that, that kind of makes sense. Um, so this is just a fair that they decided to have. This would just be the state of Nashville or the state of Tennessee, I mean, that decides to have this World's Fair in Nashville. Right. Okay. okay. Now, <clears throat> let's also, you know, when, when we're looking at something like that, there's other portions about this with Nashville that, that mean other things. Okay. I mean, the, the statue of Athena yeah. was, not, was not unveiled until the 20th of May of 1990. And then it, they had to raise additional money for that. And it wasn't until 2002 that the statue was finally completed with golden gilding and paintings. Okay, so they didn't have the statue there in 1897. Correct. And and they did rebuild the the Parthenon. 
Correct. Right. So, um, and and that, that's why some of the statements that Alan White made about the buildings and about the molds, uh, you know, indicated that this must be connected with uh, the Parthenon because this was made differently than you would normally build pillars. Right. You know, we went through the construction of this. It's kind of a unique, uh, a unique way of recreating uh, these pillars, right? So Ellen White makes reference to this uh, in her vision about the destruction of Nashville. And, and this would have been before these pillars were made in that way. That is, that it wasn't until, what, uh, 1920 or something when they rebuilt this that they, they rebuilt the pillars because before they were just kind of wood plastered over. And this time they actually um, use this concrete to replicate uh, uh, the pillars in the Parthenon in Greece. Right? Correct. Um, now, then the dates of these world fairs, they normally run uh, six months. Correct. But so I think it's whatever it is. Um, it's not six months on our calendar. Uh, but they have a way in which they do it. I can't remember how they, I think it's like 183 days or something like that. Right. Um, now, yeah. In, in this situation, when the Tennessee Central organizers laid the foundation for the Parthenon, they did that in 1895. They did have the centennial exposition that they did allow to run from May 1st to October 30th of 1897. October 31st. Right? I'm, mean. I'm looking at, I'm looking at the, the website that's set up by the state of Tennessee. Okay. And I'm just looking at Wikipedia. Okay. Now, it wasn't until 1901 that Nashville Board of Parks was created. And they established in 1902 the, the Tennessee Centennial Grounds. So there's a whole history on this, but it, the pictures are interesting. Unfortunately, they're also kind of damning, especially in putting so much gold over what what amounts to being an idol. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you go from May 1st to October 31st, it's 183 days uh, in a, uh, what's the word, cardinal count. Right. So October 31st would be the 184th day. So you may be correct. It may have ended on the 30th, but... Um, but May 1st to the, so the beginning of May to the end of October, whether it was the 30th or the 31st, I don't know, but uh, somebody made a mistake there somewhere, but I'd always seen the 31st before. Um, okay, so, so there's a lot of information about, about this, this exposition. So one of the things it was, they, it was definitely an anti uh, like it was um, it, it was against the north so they were trying to show that that the south is intellectual right because this right. is this this college city and and that their ideas um, regarding the blacks and the segregation it was it was in favor of of the segregation, my understanding of it, and uh, so uh, they looked at their culture in the south as opposed to the culture in the north. So in some ways, it's a continuation of the ideas during the Civil War. But does that seem fair? I would have to agree with you. Okay, so from the things that I've read, that's that's what they've they look at with with what was discussed there. So the so the South 
is seen its its ideology regarding race as superior to that of the North, and that they're they're an intellectual society, and um, that they were supporting. And especially at this time, you're going to see a lot of these ideas that have come from uh, uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. Um, that that is going to be part of these intellectual ideas that see the whites as superior to black. So you get white supremacism is part of the reason behind this celebration of the state of Tennessee. And um, so, so we see these parallels to the civil war in 1863, when the Adventist church, or was the civil war begins before that. But in 1863, we have the Adventist church organized during the time of the civil war. And we can see that there's a civil war going on in the United States. And now part of what, what um, the counterfeit that goes before the true, you have Parminder's movement that's woke, right? That it's, it's supporting extreme ideas regarding race, basically a reverse racism. And the idea that there's white privilege and that, that you know we should all admit that we're privileged because we're white, even though that's not really logical because not everybody's privileged because they're white, not everybody's disadvantaged because they're black or in a minority, right? So, so that sort of, those ideas of wokeism, they're being dismissed or challenged by this, this part of our movement that rejects Parminder's messages. So we see it as error and have not, nothing to do with the gospel because all people should be treated the same. We, should, we shouldn't be looking at people's race. Uh, people shouldn't be picked in positions because they're black or white or any other color, right? Um, and, and of course they have all these other issues attached to it, you know, LGBTQ and feminism and different ideas. So, so in our part, what we would call the alpha, the alpha movement uh, rejects these ideas of Parminder. And now we're going to have this message that's going to be about Nashville. So is, is that coincidental or is that connected? Simply put, is the attack on Nashville that we're predicting symbolic of an attack upon the idolatry and the ideas that Parminder has? Yes. Okay. Right. So the message that we're giving is not just a different message. It's antithetical to what Parminder had presented. Correct. Because racism is racism, no matter which way you flip the race. And, and he's also promoting a type of intellectualism, right? That you need to go to the proper schools with the proper teachers. That you can't think for yourself. Okay, but see, it, that type, of, that type of, of thought process and comment mm -hmm. is directly against what we're seeing in scripture and what we have been taught in the spirit of prophecy. Because mm -hmm. God can teach each person individually. Well, there, as, there, yeah. as two examples, what schools did Christ and John the Baptist attend to fit them for their work? Well, the school of the home. And what are we told about the school that they both attended? Had they attended the schools of the rabbis of their time, they would have been wholly unfitted for their work. Right. Because because to go to the schools, generally speaking, you have to submit to their authority, especially especially in those days. Right. 
exactly. But at, in the day that we have right now, mm -hmm. I have I have been in front of those that believe that because they are trained, quote unquote, in Hebrew and in Greek, that their understanding is necessary to be able to enlighten the minds of others. Yeah. And that without them, that a true understanding of scripture is not possible. Now that flies in the face of what father Miller taught that yeah. fight flies very much in the face of what we've seen in the Bible. Yeah. I don't know why all these things are doubles. Anyway, yeah, so we know that each of us can learn of God because God can teach us. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't study with each other, but the Bible is the authority, and no man can be the judge to know what is truth, right? You know, for another. Read. Yeah, and, and we see that that um, this system of education wasn't just a problem in the South. For um, It became a problem in the North, of course, as well, uh, with, even within Adventism. Now, Ellen White's involved in setting up schools in Tennessee, correct? Very correct. So this is part of what was happening uh, at that, that time. Uh, with with the situ with situation with Edson, so Edson was involved in um, uh, helping the work in the South, and part of that was to help educate people. With um, the name of the school escapes me. What was it called? Um, Madison. Madison, right? And so so Madison College was to look like a farm. Ellen White says, people could come onto the campus and they won't see a school. They'll see a farm. And um, so the training that they were to receive was nothing like the education of the world. And of course, those things changed within Adventism. I, I studied all of this back quite a long time ago, about four years ago. So. Um, I don't remember all the details, uh, but I was in the self-supporting work in Alberta. And so we, we, uh, we were starting a school. And so we looked at uh, this history. And we had one, one brother was particularly uh, studied in this area. And so we, we studied the material that Ellen White said about Madison, the people involved in that school. Ellen White sat on the board of Madison. Um, now, Madison later became, what was the name changed to? Anybody remember? I'm trying to remember the names of these things, and I don't remember. Could, somebody could look it up, I guess. Uh, let me see here. Um, okay, um, so it's now called Madison Area Technical College. I don't know if that's correct. I don't know if I'm looking at the right school at all. Uh, no, this is something else. Or... Um, What I'm looking at is saying Nashville Agricultural and Normal Institute. Yeah, right. Uh, that was the original name, right? Um, it would look to be that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, I knew it had some other name. Uh, so, so this, so this judgment that's going to be coming upon Nashville that Ellen White's talking about. 
she writes about it in the context of them doing this work in the South. Right? That's that's the context. Right. And we can see then that what Parminder's message is, is about is really antithetical to this message. Now, Parminder doesn't like the work program at the School of the Prophets. Right. He thinks that that is, you know, slavery or something like that. You know, people think, agree indentured servitude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is 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 rather ridiculous. I mean, uh, if you ever seen what um, slavery is like, there's nothing similar. I mean, you know, I do have a complaint about the fact that we were cleaning rooms that weren't dirty. Um, but and, and that work needs to be actual productive work, which it wasn't. But to, to sort of characterize it in the way that Parminder does is, of course, wrong. Um, and it was very good when we were there in 2016. I have no complaints. Uh, 2016, we did productive work. Though I have to say that the gardens, you know, we, there just weren't experienced gardeners running the place. So, you know, this idea of... Uh, no-till gardening makes no sense in Arkansas because everything just molds and rots. So it's not really the best type of gardening. But, you know, be that as it may, you, you can't characterize that as slavery. And the idea of a work-study program, uh, I went through a school, a Silver Hills, in, in British Columbia, and basically it was mostly work. I mean, I worked eight hours a day. And, you know, our study was one class in the morning, you know, at six o'clock in the morning. So um, it wasn't, it, it, to me, it's how a school should be. And it's productive. That is all the work that we did supported the school, right? We had a sawmill, we had market gardens. And uh, so everything that we did, the school wouldn't have survived without it, right? So, so to me, that's what uh, true education is. It teaches you to be useful. I used to be useless. I was raised in the city. Didn't really know how to work. So at Silver Hills, I learned how to work. I became a useful human being. And that's what our school should do. Plus, they're spiritual, right? Um, and you learn to work in a spiritual manner. That is, you don't just work uh, for money. You're working because what you're doing is in and of itself productive and useful. So you learn to enjoy work for what it does, what it accomplishes, not for how much money you get. And so I learned an awful lot at, at Silverhills. And, and, you know, I only had one teacher, really, you know, Leroy, and he had one student, me, right? So um, uh, it, was, it was, to me, an ideal situation for somebody like me at that time in my life. Now, um, so anyway, the point is that what we have here is we have an attack upon Nashville, which is related to this ideology. And we, we also know that the ideas of slavery uh, and the issues of uh, Ellen White's visions in regard to the Civil War relate to the oppression of the Blacks. Now, the world's answer to that is wokeism, but wokeism creates the problem that you're seeking to solve, correct? I would believe that to be the case. You know, it, it doesn't help race relations by distinguishing the differences between black and whites and pitting them against each other. The whole idea of civil rights movement is that that all are equal, that people should be judged by not the color of the skin, but the, by the content of their character. And that's true always. That's the principle of, of, the, of the Constitution, that all men are created equal. And that the state, the government should treat all men equal. There shouldn't be special 
privileges to any group, even if we think they're disadvantaged. Right? So the, these principles are being that are, are biblical are being rejected by Parminder's movement, but in a um, a deceptive way. That is, they seem to believe that they're standing up for the Constitution when they're doing everything to trample its principles. Right? Would you agree with me on that? <clears throat> I would have to say yes. Okay, so if we look at this line then of Jeroboam, uh, what is the darkness? Because we said before that this has to do with July 18th, right? That this message is being rejected by, by the movement, Parminder's movement in particular. And so when we get to November 9th, we now have um, this new message of July 18th. But that's, that's sort of on the surface, based on what we talked about. What is the darkness then? The misunderstandings that Parminder and Tess brought into the, to the message. Okay. And so what are those misunderstandings? What are the things that Parminder and Tess that are bringing in that are being addressed by this reform line of Jared Bale? Let Bale plead. I would I would have to think the liberalism, the um, belief in the agendas of the small people, and specifically Tess's more than admiration of uh, that one representative. AOC. Of, AOC, yes. Okay. And, and of course, we know AOC is born on uh, October 13th, 1989. Tess is born November 9th, 2000, uh, uh, not 2000, 1990. And, and they're going to be born 300 and 391 and a half days apart. Right? Well, it would have been interesting had Tess been born in the 2000s. You're right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but 1990. Uh, so she's born one year and, you know, whatever it is, 26 days later. So um, so anyway, we have this um, we have this message. Now, now to define it clearly, we we know that it has to do with the rejection of July 18 and this promotion of these ideas of how to understand the truth. So to me, the particular statement uh, is one that I record in my paper uh, dealing with the, um, the rebellion at Bale Peor. So I quote Parminder from, uh, this is the, the sort of question and answer period they had at the end of their, um, whatever it was, organizational meeting or something in Germany in, in 2019, where they just basically had lots of fun. And um, so let me see if I can find this here quickly. And um, so they had this question and answer session about how they were to deal with uh, these new ideas, you know, dress and how other people were be, to be treated and how they were to uh, understand the truth. And the statement that he made um, had to do with, uh, let me see here. Okay. I have it in quotations. Uh, so he says, praying is not enough. You need to go to someone who will teach you. Then it, the question, because they're reading these questions from a piece of paper. Then it, the question says, should we just submit to everything the leaders of the movement say? And then he answers, until you learn to use the rules, it is probably a wise decision. Because your other option is to submit to nothing that the leaders of the movement say. Now, 
Is that true? Is that your other option? No. No. I would it, agree, this, no. This is called the false dichotomy. It, it, it's just, it's either or. Either you listen to, uh, you submit to everything the leaders of the movement say, or nothing that the leaders of the movement say. Right? And, and of course, that, that's not true. I mean, he's making it true. Either you listen to what we say or, you know, you're out. But anyway, so he says, if you frame the question that you have, that you have to accept everything, submit to everything, the opposite is to submit to nothing. Again, that's not true. And it's nothing to do with the framing of the question, because the question is quite simple. Should we accept everything that you say? Do we have to submit to it? Or can we we examine it? Can we be Bereans? Can we compare scripture with scripture? But Parminder saying no. No, you have you have a choice. You either accept everything or you accept nothing. If you are going to say that you accept some things and not others, on what basis would you accept or reject things? Now he says it can't be upon conviction because conviction is based upon rules and principles. So you are just going through circular arguments. Now, this is pretty good gaslighting, uh, quite clever. <laughs> now, of course, on what basis would you uh, accept or reject things? What's, what's the basis for accepting or rejecting something? The word of God. Yeah, the Bible. We, we, we study God's word. If it agrees with God's word, we can accept it as true. Now, he says, well, it can't be upon conviction. Well, I'm not really sure what that means. Um, because if you're convicted that something is not true, you're going to reject it because it contradicts God's word. I mean, that's a very good reason to reject something as that, that it's not true, that it's error, right? And, and Parminder is actually going through the circular arguments, not the person who's asking the question, right? Because he's making it a circular argument. He's making a circular argument. He's saying, agree. you have to accept what I say. And if you don't accept what I say, uh, you can't do that. Because... I'm saying that there's rules and principles that I've set up that you have to follow. And you have to accept that conviction is based upon rules and principles. Now, I'm not sure what he means by that. If you mean that the Bible is a rule and that the principle of love is what actuates us, then yes, conviction is based upon that. And that is what we should uh, use. Now, he can't set up those rules and principles. He can't make himself the rule. But that's what he's doing. So then what he says, I suggest that we pray to learn how to use rules. Faith and works go together. Go to a decent school. Be instructed by good teachers. You will learn to use the rules. When you do that, you will intelligently submit to everything the leaders of the movement say. So you, if you study our rules and our principles, you will agree with us. And so you will submit to what we say. I mean, this is so papal, but you can see this is what the movement was really being offered as a choice with Parminder's movement. Now, the question is, was the movement really that different in how it was operating? That is, was there much difference between the Omega and the Alpha? in practice. December 6th shows that it, it wasn't, right? So we have, if we look at this here, um, this chart, and we're going to uh, compare it to some other charts that we've made. We usually have that there's a group of people being tested 
by what we call the first angel's message, right? So in Millerite history, this is going to be the Protestants. So, so we have to look at this line and decide if this is actually correct. So we, we may change this line. Um, so definitely we can see that there is um, this message that arrives, and this message is about July 18th. Now, I have June 27th in there. I don't know if that's that should be in there or not, right? So, so we went through this before. But now that we define this darkness a little bit better, and this first message, that this first message is about July 18th. But July 18th is a message about the destruction of the principles that are, that are being promulgated in this, this, this exposition in Nashville, right? Can, can we say that that's what's happening? That it's a rejection of Parminder's message, because Parminder's message is about papal education. And then we're going to give a message that's about the destruction of the Parthenon, which symbolizes that. And remember, uh, Parminder and Tess support the Democrats. Is Tennessee a democratic state? Are they teaching the principles of the Democrats, the message of the King of the South? at the time that the Nashville Parthenon is built, at the time of this exposition. Is the South Democrat in this, in this history? No. No? Dwight? The South has always been Democrat. Okay, William. Uh, in, how, in, how do you in a lot of ways, it? William is very correct. Yeah. Because they viewed those that came from the North after the Civil War as being carpetbaggers interfering with the way that things had been in the South for many years. Right. So, so when we look at the idea of the de ideas of the Democrats, like they, they. They were the racists. Yes. Right. Now they paint themselves as not being racist, even though they're still the racists. Okay. Who, who was the president that was the the first Democrat? Um, I don't know. Andrew Jackson. Okay. Where do you see Andrew Jackson prominently displayed? Well, in the South. You find Andrew Jackson displayed on most on pieces of money in most people's wallets because he's on the $20 bill. Okay. Now, Andrew Jackson, of all of the presidents that have been here, has been the most openly racist. He was a slaveholder, number one. He had no um, concern for Native Americans. He viewed them as less than human. So this this was a man that was highly racist. Yeah. Now, now the Democrats try to pay, pay, uh, uh, portray themselves as opposed to racism. Right. And but that's uh, that's their way of saying that we want to deflect this. Right. I mean, wh what state did Jackson come from? Tennessee. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and the thing about it is the policies uh, show racism. Right. That is, if you look at a class as, as needing help, then you obviously don't believe that those people 
can help themselves, that they're disadvantaged in some way because of their race. And so you don't help them in the end. I mean, you keep them subjugated. So, uh, so when we look at, at the South, the South is Democrat. This isn't a Republican state, right, at that time. I mean, I'm not sure all, you know, who's the, the governor or whatever the different things happen in, in the U.S. But, but this is really dem democratic ideas, the ideas of the Democratic Party that are being promoted. Um, from what I've read about the, the this, this exposition in Nashville. This is a celebration of the South. You know, and I'm, I'm not that familiar with the South, right? I'm Canadian. We don't really study much um, American history. But I know a little bit from what we've studied in this movement and from Ellen White's writings and what was happening. So, so anyway, we have this message of July 18th, and we have a group that's being tested. So every time we have a, a message, the first message and the second message, there are going to be groups that are being tested. So we have here. Um, so what groups being tested by this first message? And what group is being tested by the second message? Is the is it not those that are in the movement that are being tested by the first message? Okay, well, yeah, it's a group in the movement, but how would we characterize it? We just can't say the movement because the movement's going to be tested by the second message. So what part of the movement is being tested by the first message? But isn't all of the movement being tested by the first message and then part being tested by the second? Okay, yeah, yes. But there's a group that's going to fail, right? Right, agreed. Right, so you have in, in Millerite history of the Protestants and then you have the Millerites. Well, obviously the Millerites are Protestants, right? Agreed. But so I'm just saying that we, we need to define it more because we couldn't put in the first one movement and the second one movement. We have to have two different distinctions. So if I put in FFA in this first group, that makes sense that FFA is being tested under this first message. Yes. Okay. So that's what, that was, that's what we're going to say. FFA is being tested by this first message. Now, FFA is going to come to the failure of the J July 18, 2020 prediction. And, and they are going to respond with the idea that this was a mistake. Right, so they're going to reject. They're not going to accept the first message, really. Correct. And and then they're going to be in this tearing time under the second message. So we're saying the second message, though. So we have to discuss whether these are the correct, correct uh, things to place there. Um, we we probably could do this. So I'm going to get rid of this. So this is just me thinking, but. I'm going to put July 18 here, and I'm going to put uh, July 19 here. 
Does that make more sense? It fits. Okay. Now, so we make this proclamation about Nashville and that proclamation fails. Now, I understand why I put uh, June 27th there. Um, but I think that this fits better at, uh, in, in how we have defined this darkness. So we're now being tested. We have this message that's being given to test us. And, and what we're being tested on is, is this message that arrived on November 9th. And that message isn't just about July 18th. It's really about how we study the Bible. Agreed. Okay. And, and yet it's, it's embodied in the proclamation of a warning to Nashville. And this warning to Nashville is, an, is talking about an attack upon a city that symbolizes something that is still in the movement. That It, it symbolizes, in a sense, Parminder's message. That's the darkness. And remember, a message comes in response to the darkness. That is, it, it's meant to, to show that that darkness is darkness and to correct it. So, so it's going to be empowered when our prediction fails on July 18th. Now, on July 19th, we now have a message that we're on a line of failed predictions. And that we need to come to grips with what these lines mean. And then I'm going to write a paper called After July 18th. That's July 19th, right? It's after July 18th. That explains the failure in, in really clear terms, I, I think, you know, from my perspective, because I wrote the paper and I understand it. But to me, it's quite clear that we were not prepared for what was going to come upon us and that we had to be tested. I actually, in that paper I have, I show these lines like that, that you have a group being tested and then another group being tested in Millerite history. And that we're repeating Millerite history. The going forth of the virgins is the first angel's message. And the tarrying time is the second angel's message. During the tarrying time, they, they're gonna tarry and this cry goes out, at midnight, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, right? And so the wise and the foolish are going to be separated. And, and so we have here, we have July 19th. We now have this message, this first disappointment. And, and now we're in this tearing time. And we're going to be evaluating, did we have a correct message? And FFA is going to formalize this by rejecting uh, all of the message that went before. And then it's gonna be empowered on December 25th when Nashville attack occurs, right? That's, that's what we're saying is that attack on Nashville, that bombing that occurs comes at a time that fits into the structures of these lines. It's gonna be 187 days after the publication of the warning to Nashville. And then we have a, a message, right? And that message is going to be all about the time, how, because once we get to December 25th, we start to, to build and construct these lines with these dates that this movement is passing through, right? So on December 26th, um, uh, let me see, how does this go? So uh, December 25th, so it's going to be December 26th. Um, no, it's going to be, it's going to be, I'm trying to think. I'm getting this all mixed up. So when we, we start a study on, I think it's going to be March, March 7th, 2021, we're going to start examining the foundation, right? Correct. Yeah, and then we're going to go through that study, and we're going to do that in 187 studies, and then, and then we're going to come to uh, um, December 26, 2021, and we're going to begin uh, 
this study that we're presently in understanding the lines. Okay, so I got that right now. Um, so, but when we have that attack upon Nashville, this, um, this gives us now that we are in this history. And then we're gonna have, of course, the January 6th siege of Washington, and we're gonna see how that fits in with all these structures. But the point is in this particular line, this line of Jeroboam, it's addressing let Baal plead, right? That is, if this message of Parminder's was true, if false worship and, and false Bible study is true, then let's see, let's see it demonstrated, right? Does, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And so when we get to the third angel arriving, we get to the message where, where Stephen recognizes the 777 years. We have the conflict, uh, you know, with Colin, not really with Colin, but with the Canadian group, because I don't think I'm in conflict with Colin on that day. Um, and, and then we have Colin's presentation. Uh, we can see that that's a third message arriving. And now in the context, if we looked at this as Millerite history, we would see um, in this line, just in this line as a line compared with Millerite history. So this is something internal within this movement, um, this line. So we would say that, that this is Jeff proclaiming this message. We can see that Jeff is here, right? FFA is his organization. And Jeff is proclaiming a message, a correct message, against what Parminder has been teaching. And it's going to be empowered on July 18. But after July 18, or July 19, Jeff is has, has ended FFA. I mean... He says, that's the end of FFA. It's not going to continue past July 18. And, and it doesn't really. I mean, we have this group that holds the reins of FFA. They own, own the assets. But they're going to reject that message, right? And they do that on December 6th. Okay, so that's going to be a formalization of this message that arrived. It's, it's a rejection of the message. And then we say December 25th, where we have the bombing of Nashville, that becomes the empowerment of this message of after July 18th. So July 19th, we're going to have this um, period of time, right? So we're going to have December 25th, 2020. And... And then we're going to have what we put here is this third message arrives on December 25th, 2021. Any questions about this line? Is there something that, are you happy with how I changed, removed that one date and put July 18 there? So then what we have is we have, in Millerite history, you have the first generation. In the first generation, you're going to have a fourth angel arriving. We would put that at 1863, right? If you understand what I'm saying. So there's a progressive destruction of four in, the, in Adventist history after you would line this up with the October 22nd, 1844, in this line, and you would line this up with 1863, and you would line this up with 9-11. Right. If you're just going to take that template of Millerite history connected with Adventist history and the history of this movement, that would just lay over top of this. So we can see we're repeating that history since November 9th. And that's the symbols, these dates. November 5th is a symbol. Uh, or not November 5th. April 5th, 2030 is a symbol. And, and then this one is just... In this movement, we can see that with the end of Colin's prediction, we are in a different time than we were with December 25th, 2021. That is, we're in, I mean, that 
third angel arrived and we're in the time of that third angel. But we have this other message that arrives. And so this creates this way mark, the fourth angel arriving. But this is the fourth angel arriving within the first generation, right, 1863. So here this is 9-11. And you can see, see how that fits together. Anybody have questions about that? Either this is clear and everybody understands it, or it's not clear and people are puzzled. So anybody have trouble understanding what's being presented in this line? Okay, so we have the line. Yeah, we haven't applied the scriptures to this line. That is, we say we have this line, and we're saying it's the line of Jeroboam, and it's based upon the idea that Jeroboam is let Baal plead, and it has to do with this education. But we need to see in the story of Gideon and Jeroboam, in this, these, these stories, we need to see that we can support these waymarks by the symbols that have been given to us. Right? So it's fine. We can make this line, but unless this is supported by this pass, these passages in the book of Judges, then this line is just a creation of our own understanding. It's just arbitrary. So we need to see that, that this is indeed supported by these scriptures. So we have this period of darkness, and we're saying that November 9th, 2019, is the first angel arriving. What scripture in the book of Judges is going to be marking that? What are the symbols here? Where do we mark the time of the end? We know we have this story of, of Gideon. Are we just going to say, it, it, can a name change mark that? Or are we going to use something else? Well, a name change can mark it. Yeah. I think in this situation that something else is going to have to be used. Okay, so what are we going to use? We know when we go through this story, it's going to give us this background of this period that would represent their period of darkness, that is, they're under oppression of the Midianites. And we've said that, that this is the strife that exists, and we can see that this movement, this line here, is a line in which this movement is in strife, that is, it's striving against each other. We have the conflict with Parminder, and then we have the internal conflict that happens after Parminder. We have this whole story of this, this offering, right, the call of Gideon. Right, so we have this whole story of the call of Gideon. But then we're going to have Gideon... Um, destroying this altar. Now, I think we could maybe place the destruction of the altar as the time of the end, but we would need to know what these symbols are. Now, we had spent some time looking at this regarding this offering because it had some interesting details. Um, so when the men of the city arose early in the morning, and behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cut, cut down that was by it. And the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. So what is this talking about, this bullock that's offered? What, what is this? We know that it's seven years old, right? Okay. I'm, you know, I'm not tracking completely with, with why you're going to this where you're going at, going at it right now in this portion of, of Judges. Okay, so I'm trying to find the time of the end. Okay, let's, yeah. let's scroll back a bit to Judges 6, 7. Okay. Uh, it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up out of Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. So we're going to apply that um, to Jeff, right? 
Yeah. Okay. So we're saying that this is happening prior to November 9th. Right. Okay. And yeah. Okay. Because in, in this section from verse seven to verse 10, mm -hmm. we have this unnamed prophet. Right. That is reminding them of their departure from doing that which God would have them to do. Right. And that's Jeff on September 7th. So here again, on when we come to Judges 6, verse 10, and I said unto you, I am the Lord your God, fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Yeah. Here is God not only reminding them of their duty unto him, but showing them that they had not accomplished the work that they were to have accomplished. Mm -hmm. So I would have to say these verses more typify the time of the end because we're, we're seeing that this prophet is like a, a forerunner of John the Baptist, a forerunner of William Miller, a forerunner of Elder Jeff. Okay. I understand what you're saying. So the way that we looked at this before, so we dealt with the line of Judges 6 by itself. And in Judges 6 by itself, we would do that. In Judges 7 by itself, we dealt with the line as well in Judges 8 by itself. But now when we look at this whole line, we would look at this as something during the period of darkness. Because this line is good. Jeff is there before November 9th, 2019. And, and, and that would include all of his history before that. But specifically, when we get to September 7th, he's going to uh, wake up you know, from his five months of sleep, his hiding, right? And he's going to speak out against this message of Parmenders. Now, all of that in this line of Gideon is a period of darkness. So it's, to me, okay. it's really a part of the period of darkness that, that's going to proceed this time of the end, because this is going to be November 9th. And, and what's going to ha happen is a message is going to be given. It's going to be given by Jeff, right? And by FFA, but it's going to be the message of July 18th. Right. Right. So that's, that's going to be the message that he's going to give. And that's going to be on November 9th that we're marking this. So November 9th is the time of the end. And so, in this context, in this line, we look at this prophet as something in the past, right? And now this new message comes, and, and we've applied it different ways as well, because we could even apply it to September 11th. That is, there's this message of Jeff prior to September 11th, and Jeff uh, at September 11th, he now has this new message. It's the second angel's message arriving. And this whole line of the judges is a zoom into that arrival of the second angel. And this, this line here, the line of, of Jeroboam is going to be this line addressing uh, the formalization of the message of, of the judges, right? So it's going to be, you know, proceeding down in time in this movement. So now we're at November 9th, which parallels with September 11th. Um, but there still is a darkness within the movement. That is, there is this, this conflict or this strife. And this strife is partly about strife between people, but it's really about strife between ideologies, between the worship of Baal, which it represents Parminder's ideas about how we are going to teach, and and Miller's rules. So that you have this conflict here. And the whole thing about Miller's rules is 
that the individual themselves can learn and understand the truth for themselves. That they don't just, no man is an authority to tell you what is truth. Even the church. Because the church can be an error. The church is not infallible. Now the church is supposed to be accepting God's word and working together. So when we get this call of Gideon, this is the specific message about July 18th that's arriving, but it's arriving on November 9th. So does that help, Dwight, in what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. So, so the question then goes back, we need some symbols, you know, either from uh, the words of the scriptures, the numbers that are there, the meanings of names, uh, the numbers of the verses themselves, and that can mark the time of the end. Now, we used, when we were doing chapter 6, uh, we used uh, 611 to mark 911 and 119, right? By taking that, that number, I put it right. in a little box, box and I saved it as a picture and I could flip it over. And I'd go 11, 11 with this six, and then I'd flip it up and it would be 11, nine, right? Correct. So, okay. So, so, but we know that 9, 11 and 11, nine are the same way, Mark, um, just in different lines. And, and we're saying here that this is 11, nine. And so when we looked at chapter six, we just said, this is 11, nine, this is 9, 11, this is the time of the end, this is the arrival of the first message, right? But now we're looking at the whole line and, and we could say, we could just take the whole call of Gideon and say that is the time of the end. But I wanna see if there's other symbols here that can help us place this at November 11th in the context of this line that we have. So we know there's a whole bunch of symbols here. He's sitting under this oak, right? He's threshing wheat. He's by the wine press and he's hiding it from the Midianites. So this is about a message that's been hidden, right? Um, and that it's being hidden because it's being uh, oppressed, right? And, and we can see that that happened to this message of July 18th through this history. Right. You know, from when it was first presented in 2018 and it was then suppressed. And, and now this message is going to be revived at November on November 9th. Right. Uh, Jeff, now Jeff, of course, started studying it before then. But when we get to November 9th, it, it definitely becomes Parminder's message is failed. We have this new message. It's July 18th. And this is what we're going to be proclaiming, right? And and we looked at how you know people were trying to get Jeff to not proclaim time. They were with him, but when he gets to November 9th and he continues to proclaim time, a lot of those people who had come back for a brief time after Parminder was gone, they're gone again, right? Uh, people like uh, Larry um, from. Uh, Australia, I can't think of his last name, uh, Daughtry, right? People like him. But there was lots of other people. People were coming and saying, look, we're with you, Jeff. We didn't like Parminder. We didn't like what you were doing with his time setting. Let's go back to where we were before Parminder came, before Parminder started talking about time setting. Let's go back to, you know, prior to June 9th, 2018. Right? That's what people were saying to Jeff. And Jeff says no. Now, why does Jeff say no? Why didn't Jeff just say, yeah, you were right. Par I got deceived by Parminder. I got deceived by his time setting uh, and his arguments. He was being deceptive. Let, let's just go back and, and just write off this last year. Why didn't Jeff do that? Wouldn't that, have just, wouldn't that have been antithetical to the 
to the history? There's nothing in the lines that tell us this, right? Okay. Right. Do we have some example in the lines where we could say, ah, oh, you know, here we are in this line, and we can compare it to some other history, and and so that would be a fulfillment of us repeating Millerite history. Do we see that in Millerite history anywhere? Do we see anywhere in Millerite history the movement rejecting that what it did was wrong and it continues on as the true movement? No. No, right. So, so Jeff understands this, that if he rejects what they had been doing, this would be a rejection of the idea Idea that this movement has anything to do with repeating Millerite history. Jeff understood the logic that would have to be employed if he took this position. So it's not it's it's not his personal pride, you know, that would be hurt by admitting he was wrong, because Jeff quite willingly admitted he was wrong to trust Parminder, but he understood where in the line. This is illustrated, and it's illustrated at the rebellion at Baal Peor. Is Moses in rebellion at Baal Peor? Is Moses in rebellion? No. No, right? So Moses, Moses can admit his mistake that he wasn't aware of what was going on, but he's not going to say, oh, the people who are, you know, um, are deceived by the Moabite women, you know, they're, they're in the right and I'm in the wrong, right? So, so Jeff understood the lines enough. He understood the past history enough to know that we were fulfilling Millerite history because people are leaving the movement because they're beguiled by the teachings of the Protestants, right? So he can see, he can see the lines quite clearly. So right. Jeff isn't going to renounce time setting and say that the, we, we just need to write off this last year because there's no precedent for it. So he's just following what, what, it, what God has been showing him all, over, all along. Now he can see he was deceived. And, and we can see examples where God's leaders are deceived and they repent of being deceived, but they don't buy into the deception that it was, was correct. If we're going to say the time setting was wrong, uh, you know, see the, the argument, the way that people look at it is Jeff got deceived by Parminder. And so the simple thing was to say you were deceived. Right. So let's abandon everything that Parminder was teaching. And, and so they had a hard time understanding why he would reject only some of the things that Parminder was teaching. But one of the things we know is that Satan mixes truth with error, right? Very correct, yes. And he does it for two reasons. One is to make error more palatable, but the other is to bury truths that are present truth so that people will throw out the baby with the bathwater. And so Jeff wasn't willing to do that. He knew, based upon everything that we had studied, that there was, there was truth there. Plus, it was witnessed to November 9th, 2019, by this, this history of chronology, analysis of the chronology in the Bible, and it was witnessed to with this other date that was rejected by Parminder. So Parminder rejected July 18th. We have to remember that. Parminder wasn't um, just teaching things. He was also rejecting other things. And the thing that he was rejecting was the thing that was his undoing, right? That is, he couldn't 
He couldn't keep up a logically consistent argument when we had something so powerful witnessing to November 9th. And that that very thing that witnessed that Parminder was in error, which was this chronology and the September 7th and all this structure, you couldn't just get rid of it. Right. So so Jeff understood this. He understood the role of Samuel Snow's letters. Right? How Samuel Snow's letters fit into this structure, how everything in this movement was pointing towards July 18th. So if we're going to, to look at um, the time of the end for this line, we can see that, that we have to pick uh, something here that's going to mark the time of the end. Now, I think what we can do here is we can take this whole story of the call of Gideon and we can place this prior to the time of the end. But there are some symbols in here about this offering that we need to, to address, right? Because we, it, there's going to be this offering, right? There's going to be this, this bullock, right? There's going to be the, the first he's going to have this small offering of these unleavened cakes, right? And then he's going to have this altar that he's going to build. So he's going to build an altar to the Lord, and he's going to offer this... Um, uh, uh, a young bullock, and then he's going to take a second bullock. So we've looked at this before, but I think we can understand it better now. This is what we're going to look at uh, tomorrow. Um, and then we we should then be able to argue that the destruction of the altar of Baal is going to be the time of the end. In this line. It's going to be it's going to be dealing with this November 9th that and that sense. Yeah. And that the naming of Gideon as Jeroboam in this line is going to be the verses that are going to be used to mark the time of the end in this line. Right. So this destruction of the altar and the renaming of Gideon. Now, that's not going to be true when we look at the line of Gideon. We're actually going to look at different verses that mark the time of the end there, because these are different lines, even though they start with the same date. The different verses are are going to be describing what this line is. <clears throat> so, you know, so the one thing I want to say about this, I mean, I know when we're going through these studies. I mean, it's it's difficult because I can't see everyone and not everybody's always in a position because of what they're doing that they can speak. Um, but I really want to have feedback about these lines so that, um, you know, this isn't just me producing these lines and using my, my, my arguments to produce them, that we can really all see this and that, that we're testing these lines, that we're saying, yeah, this, this is solid. And um, because we have to present these lines again to this movement in an organized fashion with, with solid evidence for this, and also that these meanings of these lines, these messages are understood by us. So it's one thing to write a message, say, well, here's a message. This is the message that's here. And then it's going to be this next message and it tested us and so forth. But we need to, to really understand what that message means to us and how we learn the lessons of that message. You know, because one of the things that we, we deal with is this, and, and presently in this study, is, is strife. You know, differences of opinion, conflicts that occur. And, and we have to be really careful that we're not repeating the same mistakes that others made in the past. So if we're talking about, you know, the lessons that we should be learning and we're not actually learning them, then I don't see what the point is of having these studies. You know, it's pretty simple in that, that context. But we are struggling. Like we are, 
what we should be doing is striving, just like the Midianites strife. We should be striving to, to learn these lessons ourselves and to develop a Christ-like character. Satan is striving to destroy us. And all of us are being brought to examine our own hearts. And sometimes <clears throat> that can be very painful and very difficult. Yes. Always. The cross of Christ that we have to bear each day, which because of our self, <clears throat> uh, that's not an easy thing to do. We're bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, though, because Christ has died for us and forgiven us. Without that, we wouldn't be able to bear this cross. So we need to keep praying for one another. We have a camp meeting coming up where we believe that this is important to this movement. And we know that there is differences that exist within this movement. But God can use us uh, to, to reach others if we ourselves have a Christ-like character. So uh, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we ask for forgiveness, Lord, for our sins. And we are thankful for this study. Be with us throughout this day as we consider these things. We pray for those who have been following these messages. Some just on, on video. And we ask, Lord, that... Uh, your Holy Spirit can speak to them. May your angels watch over us. May you bring us together again according to thy will. We pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.